Welcome. I wish to acknowledge the people of the Kulin nations on whose land we are gathered today. I pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Uh, could you please silence your phones? Uh, today we're going to be using Slido to collect your feedback. So you can, having silenced your phone, you can take it out and go to slido.com and type in the event code machine. And then uh, we'll ask you to enter your feedback at the end of the session. So I'm incredibly uh, pleased to have the opportunity to finally mm -hmm. Welcome Tina Eliassi Rad uh, to Monash University. I say finally because I've been trying to get her to come here for over a decade. <laughs> so it's a very, very long time coming. Um, why have I been so eager to get uh, Tina to come? Well, because she is a leading data scientist, in particular uh, one of the leaders of the uh, field of network science. So uh, in addition to her extraordinary research, which uh, she is going to tell you about, so I won't uh, take, your, take her time in uh, seeking to replicate what uh, she has to say. Um, she has uh, been... Uh, Program Committee Chair of the Leading Data Science Conference, ACM CKDD, as well as Program Committee Chair of the Leading Network Science Conference, Network Science. <laughs> so without taking her and your precious time, I'll hand over to Tina. Please join me in welcoming her. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. Uh, and as Jeff mentioned, um, in my day job, I like thinking about graphs and networks and building machine learning algorithms and data mining algorithms for networks and graphs. And for those of you who don't know about network science, it's basically this idea that there's some phenomena happening and I would like to represent it as a network. And then I'm going to study that network and build predictive models and descriptive models. So for example, think about Facebook. There is obviously a friendship network there and you want to study the dynamics of friendship or who, for example, is your romantic partner uh, on Facebook and how can I predict that. So that's like part of network science. But today I want to talk to you guys about a recent project that I have called Just Machine Learning. It has two objectives. One is about studying machine learning algorithms and its uses in high stakes decisions. So whether, for example, you go to jail or not, or whether you get hired or not, whether you get a loan or not. So those are high stakes decisions to me. And also another part of it, another objective of it is education. And I will touch upon that at the end. So let's uh, start. Uh, I know machine learning is very popular these days. Um, but uh, the term was coined by Arthur Samuel way back in 1959, and he uh, referred to it as the following, field of study that gives computers the ability to learn without being explicitly programmed. And the very first machine learning algorithm was the Samuel's checker playing program. And it wasn't learning the way we think of learning or machine learning now. What it was doing was it was memorizing every state that the machine was in, plus the terminal reward of having been in that state. And I was doing some alpha beta pruning to search the space. So that's the origins of machine learning. And of course, it's within a part of AI. AI is much broader, but all the hype that we hear right now, they equate machine learning with AI, which actually is not um, the right thing to do. Now, machine learning in theory is this beautiful interdisciplinary flower and if I don't have your discipline up there, my apologies. I just didn't want the flower to be too, uh, too busy. But in practice, it's this XKCD cartoon. So A says to B, this is your machine learning system. B says, yep, you pour the data into this big pile of linear algebra, then collect the answers on the other side. A says, what if the answers are wrong? B says, just stir the pile until they start looking right. So 
Um, it's a little cynical, but it has a grain of truth to it. And the thing that I want you to think about is the right and wrong only have to do with, for example, accuracy. Um, they don't have any kind of moral or normative status. So when you talk to philosophers, they oftentimes talk about normative versus descriptive. Descriptive murder happens, and I can tell you, oh, there was this murder here last time, but normative is murders should not happen. You should not kill people, right? So we would like to be able to have some uh, notion of uh, morality or fairness or ethics in all of this, and there's a whole huge field on fairness and machine learning that I will talk a little bit about. So now, moving forward, I like Tom Mitchell's definition of the well-posed learning problem. So Tom Mitchell defines it as a triple. You have a task, you have experience, that's data, and you have performance measures. And Tom, in his uh, seminal textbook, and if you're new to machine learning, I highly recommend reading this book, and I do not get any kind of commission from Tom for, uh, for plugging his book. It, he defines it as follows. A computer program is set to learn from experience E with respect to some task T and some performance measure P if its performance on T as measured by P improves with experience E. So let's think about this. We, you all probably use email, um, and so your mail system has a spam filter, right? So the task there for the spam filter is to filter out the spam from the non-spam, and the experience is the spam filter observing you, for example, putting things in the spam folder or the junk folder, and the performance measure is accuracy, right? How many times um, does the spam filter um, filters your spam correctly? Now, when machine learning goes wrong, it's because one or more of task experience and performance were poorly defined. So let's think about tasks performance and experience uh, and see how this applies in terms of these high stakes decisions. The task. This is where um, um, not much work has been done in terms of fairness in machine learning and I'll talk a little bit more about it. Now the task is actually the most important part and over um, the summer, the northern summer, I was in um, Stockholm and I visited the Nobel uh, museum, and I found this quotation from Albert Einstein, which I think is worth thinking about. So he says, the mere formulation of a problem is often far more essential than its solution, which may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental skill. To raise new questions, new possibilities, to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination and marks real advances in science. So the task and what is that task is extremely important and we should think about it. And people have not been thinking a lot about it. So what have been the two most popular tasks when it comes to these high stake decisions, right? Like, for example, do you get bail or not? Do you get hired or not? Well, the two most important tasks that people have been spending a lot of time on, one is risk assessment. Risk assessment is basically classification, and classification is just sorting. High risk, low risk, right? Case number one goes to high risk. Case number two, low risk. Case number three, low risk, right? So risk assessment is just sorting or ranking, which is I'm going to, for example, for web search, I want to produce a fair ranking, a ranking that will give you enough diversity, but I have also utility. So you may say, why these two tasks? Why not other tasks? So I have a slightly cynical perspective here. One of them is because machine learning people know a lot about these two tasks. We know a lot about classification. We know a lot about risk assessments. And we know a lot about ranking. These are where we have made our <laughs> bread and butter, right? This is where we have made our fortune. The other reason is that the human decision makers, that judge, that uh, human resources person, they understand risk assessment, right? I come and say the risk of Tina committing a crime is 10 out of 10, and Peter's is two, right? 
And usually the systems that are deployed out there, they do not provide any kind of uncertainty or probability values. They just say high risk or low risk. And if you are a machine learning or a data scientist, this should make you cringe because obviously our systems always have uncertainty associated to it. It is not this absolute number on a scale of zero to 10 that the risk of TINA recidivating is eight. So there are lots of issues with these current task definitions and I'm gonna spend um, a lot of time on risk assessment because risk assessment is being used all the time. So let's look at the, some of the issues with risk assessment. So there have been some impossibility results that recently came out. If you've never heard about impossibility results, it's basically you can't have your cake and eat it too. So one was from Cholukova, who is an assistant professor at Carnegie Mellon, and she said, suppose that I can divide my population into mutually exclusive groups, let's say females and non-females, and uh, I have unequal base rates in my population. So uh, the probability of a female getting breast cancer is not the same as the probability of a non-female getting breast cancer. And she said, suppose I want to have statistical parity. Statistical parity means that the probability of my classifier predicting that somebody has breast cancer among females is the same as the probability of my classifier classifying somebody has breast cancer among my non-females. She says, if I want these three, if I'm operating under these three premises, then I cannot have these three parity or fairness measures. I cannot have precision parity, true positive parity, and false positive parity. And this is just simple linear algebra, simple probability. You probably learned the math um, in um, either early college or high school. So then later on, Kleinberg came up and said, okay, what if I have mutual exclusivity? Again, I have divided my population into females and non-females. I know I have unequal base rates, but I will get rid of the statistical parity and instead add that I have an imperfect classifier. My classifier's accuracy isn't 100%, and I have non-identical variables. So if the outcome is a variable and what I'm guessing my outcome, uh, uh, the target variable is another one and they're not identical. So these are my premises and he also showed that you can't have these th three fairness measures that you will like. And I'll talk a little bit more about these three fairness measures, but for those of you who have taken any kind of machine learning or a data science class, you would see that these fairness measures are coming from the confusion or the error matrix, right? This idea that I'm trying to predict something uh, and there's some actual um, true false values and there's some predicted true false um, values and then I'm gonna derive, for example, my true positive rate from that confusion or error, error matrix. And then recently with Brandon Feidelson, we extended Kleinberg's uh, results where we said you don't even need mutual exclusivity if you just have unequal base rates and you have an imperfect classifier, you often have an imperfect classifier and non-identical uh, variables, then you can't have these three uh, fairness or parity scores that you want to have. And so um, by, for example, not having mutual exclusivity is you can have somebody like Obama who's white and black, right? So you don't have to say blacks and non-blacks. You can have somebody that falls into both groups. So what has been the fallout from these impossibility results? Well, computer scientists are very good at bastardizing things because we like to make things work, right? Engineers at some sense. And so one of the things has been to get rid of one of the parodies, one of the fairness measures that you will like. The other one is to put some bounds on these parodies. And Deborah Hellman, who's a law professor at Virginia, has been thinking about what these parity values actually mean that you want. And so in, her, in a book that is forthcoming, she says, well, precision parity captures what you ought to believe. And true positive uh, and false positive parodies capture what you ought to do. And so what, if you're going to get rid of one of the parity measures, you should get rid of the precision parity. Because if you keep the precision parity, then what you are going to focus on are these right-making properties. 
and oftentimes being a white heterosexual male is a right making property. For example, the recent Amazon hiring system where it was systematically being biased against women if it saw anywhere female or, or, um, or woman uh, in, the, in the dossier, it would say this person would not be a good hire. So, there, so this is one aspect of problems with the current task. There are other aspects. One is that if you think about risk assessment or ranking, these tasks are just too abstract and too under-described under to have any kind of a normative of what you ought to do. Again, going back to risk assessment, it's just sorting. That's all that's happening. If you think about classification, it's just sorting, right? Red, non-red, black, non-black, so on and so forth. And I know that these are binary classification. You can also have multi-class classification, and the same thing happens. The other thing is that at least the current tasks provide no kind of uncertainty score. Nothing about, well, I think the risk of Tina committing a crime is eight, but my algorithm is only 65% sure, right? And you would think that for these high risk cases, you would want to provide some uncertainty scores, right? It's, it's good to tell the person who's using your machine learning algorithm that your machine learning algorithm isn't 100% sure. And the other aspect of risk assessment is that it doesn't take any kind of context into account, and context matters a lot. In particular, if you're thinking about these high stakes cases of, for example, using machine learning in judicial system, um, laws change, policies change, and so you should take those things into account. So just to um, nail this point about these are high stakes cases, um, there was a software that was being used in America, and it's still being used in certain places. It's called Compass Software that was produced by North Point uh, Company. And there is a uh, media company called ProPublica that does these kinds of investigative studies. And they had done this study of this Compass Software. And as part of their investigative studies, they found that there were cases where, for example, the lawyers, human beings, decide uh, a plea deal for this guy, and the judge says, there's no way I'm going to accept this plea deal because this machine learning algorithm says that the risk of recidivism of this person is very high. Now, as a machine learning uh, person, as a data scientist, this is just crazy to me that a judge would just say, well, this machine learning algorithm said the risk of Bob committing a crime is uh, eight, uh, a high risk, and so I don't care what the lawyers decided, what the expert human beings decided, right? And if you are an AI researcher, a machine learning data scientist, this should alarm you. In particular, we all know that our machine learning algorithms have a lot of hyperparameters. And depending on, and have you tried to reproduce somebody's code? Depending on how you set the hyperparameters, you could get a different result. But this is somebody's life, right, um, that is on the line. So you should care about it. So we have been working on a new task. Now, this talk is not about, oh, my algorithm is better than other people's algorithms. But it's just thinking about, well, maybe we should think about other tasks and not just um, risk assessment that maybe could take context into account and maybe could produce some uncertainty values and could be used for auditing in particular. I think that's where machine learning algorithms can be used in our, system, in our society to audit things and, and whether, for example, certain policies should be changed or certain laws should be changed. And I'll talk more about it. So what is this learning to place? So this learning to place is work with a graduate student, Shindi Wang, and a postdoc owner overall at Northeastern University, where what we say is the following. I'm given a sequence of ordered items, and now a new item comes, and I need to place this new item. Now, putting this within the criminal justice system, or just the justice system in general, um, laws are constraints that the society gives to us, and so you can put cases on this spectrum where you have better ones and you have worse ones. So for example, first degree murder is bad, much, bad, much worse than uh, petty theft, right? And so uh, usually also on this line, you're gonna have a lot of people who are doing misdemeanors and few people 
hopefully that are doing these really horrible crimes like first degree murder and these uh, first class felonies. So you have this line from before in terms of where Bob falls and Ed falls and so on and so forth, and now Peter comes, and you need to place Peter. And the idea is that your items are not uniformly ordered either, right? Clearly, again, similar to paper citations, there are a lot of papers who are only cited once or twice, and there are very few papers who are cited many times, right? So there's, you have this spectrum, but people don't fall uniformly on it. And so what we thought about was this approach of uh, step one was to learn a pairwise preference where you would go to, for example, uh, a social worker or a judge and you would say, is this case worse than this other case or is this case better than this other case? So you would get these pairwise preferences of yes or no now, from those pairwise preferences, then you would try to place them on this line in terms of, okay, this new case that has come in, where does this new case fall? And the idea being that if the new case, for example, falls between item A and B, then you would go to the judge and you would say, this new case is between item A and B, and this is my confidence of it being within this interval. And so you could do this, you can learn a classifier. Obviously your classifier is gonna be imperfect, so you're gonna have cases in which um, your classifier says a new item is uh, worse than A, but it also says the new item is better than B, and so you have to resolve these conflicts. And there are many algorithms to do this kind of a thing. We use something like maximum likelihood, which is just uh, uh, estimation, which is just voting where when a new item comes, my classifier says, um, will, will give me this pairwise preferences, and then I will just do a voting. So if, for example, the classifier says that this item is greater than item two, then anything beyond item two will get a plus, and anything before it will get a minus. And then as you do this, you would then put item four in the bucket or the interval where you got the most votes, and then you can go and tell this to the judge. So what we have been doing this is to audit um, um, fairness. So this is not a measure of, um, um, for efficiency purposes, which a lot of these risk assessments are being used, but mostly to audit cases that uh, are varied a lot. So one of the experiments that we ran was uh, normal experiments where you have a population, you divide your population and you say, okay, my training and testing it is coming, for example, here from the red population. So that would be normal because both the training and the testing set are coming from the same demographic. Or you can have cross experiments where, for example, your training set comes from uh, the red population, but your testing set is uh, from the blue population. And so basically these kinds of sensitive attributes are protected properties that people talk about, like race, gender, so on and so forth, you can flip it and you can run the counter example and see what kind of results you get. And in particular, what we're interested in is in, in terms of the kind of errors that these models make. So if, for example, I, uh, oops, sorry, I wanna come back to this. So one of the things that's extremely important is to know what is fair. Right? What is the fair line? So for us, if you are looking at this um, normal experiments versus cross experiments, the error that the model produces under the normal experiment, I'm going to call error N, and the error that the model produces under the cross ex experiments, I'm going to say it's error C. And so then the fair line is that it doesn't matter what I trained on. So if I send Tina to the model that was trained only on women, um, Tina would get the same kind of error than if I sent Tina to the model that was trained on men, right? And that it doesn't matter, the, the, the algorithm is the same in both of them, it's just that the training set were different, right? And that the, model, the error that the model is making is exactly the same, given everything else uh, are, is being fixed. So what do you see? For example, this is the famed compass data. And what we wanted to predict was the number of days until the next crime. And so what you're seeing here 
on the uh, over here for the white is where your training instance uh, is uh, so for the normal the training instance is white and the test instance is white and for the cross is the test uh, the train instance is black and the test instance is, is white so it's just the differences between the black and the white population depending on what um, the training set is and if you look at the error distributions uh, between uh, the blacks and the whites, we see that the distributions are actually different, that they're coming from different, uh, the errors that the models are, are making are coming from different distributions. Now here, I'm just showing you the KS values, but we also did earth mover distance and lots of other measures as well, that these, the errors that the two different models uh, are making are different. So what you can do then is to measure the amount of privilege or prejudice, uh, basically um, uh, favoritism or, or prejudice that exists in a data by saying, okay, how far are you from the fair line? So is uh, the error for the cross much less than the error uh, for the normal or vice versa? And here, because we were trying to predict the number of days until somebody else commits a crime, we said that if uh, the error in, within your population is bigger than the error from the cross, then you're being prejudiced against. Um, and so let's see what this, uh, this shows us on this compass data. So this is what I was just saying, that the favorite rate is the positive area under this uh, um, error curve of error cross versus error normal and the prejudice rate is on the negative side. So on the compass data, as you would expect in America, we see that the black people are prejudiced and the white people are being favored. So what you're seeing here is um, this is the favored rate and this is the prejudice rate and of course the error bars uh, um, overlap but in general we see that uh, for the black people, uh, in terms of the number of days until they are, um, uh, that, that, that we predict that they will commit another crime is a lot less, right? So in this, this idea that, oh, they should go to jail um, than, than the white people. Now you can uh, break this down by race and gender. And again, what we see is that we do see differences in terms of the model that was only trained on the white data versus the model that was just trained on the black data. And in particular, for example, we see that um, there is a very large uh, variance in terms of the error that the black model makes. So this would be a little suspicious in that why is it that the model is making such different errors on the black? So if you were to audit, you would want to look at, into the black cases that the judges are making a decision on. Um, and then you can also audit it in terms of felonies versus misdemeanors. And this is where we, it was interesting because we saw that for the misdemeanors, it seems like the, both the favored rate and the prejudice rate are about the same, but for the felonies, it is varied. The kind of um, errors that the model is making for the blacks and the whites, uh, we see differences between them. And then you can also break them in terms of ages. And this is where we saw um, the most interesting uh, difference. And the, diff uh, and the different age groups we got from a criminologist, Jack McDevitt, uh, who has been studying American judicial system for a very long time. And this is where we saw, wow, the, the, the kind of errors that we're seeing from the white and the black model, especially between the ages of 21 and 25, are very different, both if you look at the positive side of the curve or the negative side of the curve. And so if you are going to audit, then you should look and see why is there so uh, much difference in terms of what the model is saying for the black data versus the white data, right? Uh, and perhaps these are cases where um, the, the judges are using too much of their leeway. Now, there's still a problem with this. I don't I, you know, I just described this task, which would provide you some context and would give you some uncertainty and could be used for auditing, but it's still not quite there. What I really want is a task that could mimic how a person makes a decision. 
So how would I do that? So there was a recent study that came out in Science Advances where they said, okay, well, how would a human non-expert do on the same set of data that Compass used? And so they uh, did this crowdsourcing uh, for non-experts and they found that the uh, performance of the non-expert humans were just as the same as the Compass software. Now, to me, this is really bad. If I'm going to use a machine learning algorithm, the machine learning algorithm should do a lot better uh, than a non-expert human. Um, as part of this study, um, there was also this case that uh, the Compass software is a private software, but we know that they were using 137 features, and these people were able to replicate their performance by just looking at two features, age and number of previous convictions, in terms of getting the same performance measures that um, Compass was getting. So here we get to the part which is really the heart of it and computer scientists haven't really thought about, which is what is the incentive of the judge using your machine learning algorithm? Or what is the incentive of that human resources person using your machine learning algorithm or the loan officer? Is it efficiency? If it is efficiency, that should worry you, right? Especially in these high case uh, high state cases where it's whether you go to jail or not, right? I do not want my machine learning algorithm to be used for efficiency in high state cases. But knowing what are the incentives of the human decision maker, is it efficiency, is it profits, is it accuracy, is it interpretability, is extremely important. So I've been um, talking with uh, lawyers and folks in the criminal justice system in Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, um, the judges get appointed by the executive branch, the governor, and they have tenure until they're 70, at which point they're forced retirement. And it seems that the incentives for those judges in Massachusetts are three things. One is efficiency. Two is they don't want to be wrong. That is, they don't want their decision to be appealed in a higher case. And three is that they don't want to um, get caught, or for lack of a better term, I say covering their ass, uh, technical term, in that if there was an algorithm used that said risk of TINA recidivating is eight, and the judge did not take that into account, and TINA gets out, and TINA commits a crime, then that judge will be on the front cover of Boston Globe, and he or she does not want that, right? And this is, again, why it's extremely important that if machine learning algorithms are being deployed for these high-stake cases, that they do provide uncertainty values, right? Because if the machine learning algorithm said eight, the risk of TINA recidivating is eight, but my algorithm is only 65% sure, then maybe the judge will accept the plea deal, right? And not say, no, because the algorithm said high risk, I'm, I'm going to keep this guy in jail, right? Um, so the incentives are extremely important. Now, if you think about it in terms of these high state cases, like um, the judicial system or like healthcare. I haven't mentioned a lot about healthcare. This is an area that is uh, extremely important and uh, especially in places like in America where there's private insurance, it is not going to be long until the insurance company says, I will only pay for the medical treatment that the machine learning algorithm says. I will not pay for what the doctor is saying. Imagine that and your algorithm is being used. Are you okay with that? With no context or no uncertainty values, right? And I, I'm not the agent of doom and gloom. This is, this is going to come to us because people are like, oh, there's all this technology. I'm going to use it. It's going to be very efficient, especially if, for, for example, an insurance company, this is cost saving. So, but if you think about that, in America, to be a practicing physician or to be a judge, there's an apprenticeship uh, process. Uh, for example, you will clerk for a judge, or you are, uh, you're getting your bachelor's, then you are a medical uh, student, then you do an internship, then you do a residency, then you do a fellowship, and finally you're an attendant. So there is this process of internship. Maybe what the machine learning algorithm should do is um, 
try to mimic this process of apprenticeship. That is, the machine learning algorithm should learn how to behave like a good judge, how to behave like a good doctor. Now, this is a much harder task than risk assessment, right? So, um, and in fact, we do have it. It's called imitation learning or apprenticeship learning. But imitation learning or apprenticeship learning so far has been used to, for example, mimic a, a, soccer, a soccer playing. So mimic a soccer player or mimic somebody who's very good at driving and not to mimic how a judge makes a decision, which is a much harder task. So this is a hard task, much harder than sorting, which is classification, which is risk assessment. And where the normativity or the morality is built in is that I'm going to learn to behave like a good judge. Now, you may say, who decides who's a good judge or who's a good doctor? Well, in America, we do have rankings for judges. This is based on how many of their decisions are overturned upon appeal. And so, there, yes, there's this notion of who is a good or a bad judge, and you can learn, you know, what a, a judge whose cases are overturned upon appeal will decide and what a judge whose decisions have been appealed a lot would decide. Now, this is conditioned on the hardness of cases. Obviously, if, like, easy cases come to my court, then maybe there will be not as much appeal. So there are some caveats there. So for those of you who don't know what apprenticeship or imitation learning is, it's as follows. There was a really nice tutorial recently at the International Conference on Machine Learning, if you want to look at it. It's a hot area within machine learning. So what you are given is demonstrations or access to a demonstrator. And your goal is to learn a policy to mimic demonstrations. The ingredients of apprenticeship learning are obviously access to the data. The data here would be either the data you get from a demonstrator, for example, a judge or multiple judges, or court cases. Those would be demonstrations. The environment or a simulator, so you need to be within the context, state of Massachusetts. Some policy or hypothesis class, this is where uh, machine learning comes in, in that you believe that your policy is coming, let's say, from a polynomial of 10th uh, order. Don't, don't do that, that's overfitting. But, or, or, a big, uh, or, a beat, uh, or a deep network, whatever you want to pick. A loss function and some learning algorithm. So these are uh, the, uh, the ingredients of an apprenticeship learning. And then similar to, for example, what you have read in reinforcement learning, you do have a states, you have actions, you have policies that will map states to an action or a probability of an action. You have state dynamics. You, you may end up, you, you may not know which state you will end up um, given that you were at state S and you did action A. Um, and what you're trying to learn is basically distributions of trajectories. So I want to learn how a judge makes a decision as he sees a case. And so this is a lot more difficult than, for example, getting 30 years worth of compass data and dumping it out into a table and say, oh, I'm going to do some kind of classification with some constraints at the end of satisfying certain parity values. And in fact, it could be that I could have two judges and I would talk to them and um, get the court cases and so on and so forth, extract argument diagrams, and the argument diagrams of two judges would be the same, but they will end up at different decisions, right? So this idea of I want to learn how a human makes a decision is a much harder task. But where the fairness and the goodness is, is that there are some humans that are better than others, right? There are some doctors that are better than other doctors. There are some judges that are better than other judges. And in particular, in terms of judges, a good judge is one that adheres to the laws of the land, right? And that does not overreach, um, as, uh, as it's often known. Now, I'm not the first person to harp on this, right? There are other people who have also talked about this idea of perhaps some kind of reinforcement learning or with imitation learning and, uh, and a case of imitation learning or apprenticeship learning is inverse reinforcement learning where you don't see the rewards, you have instances of policies and you're trying to extract the reward. Um, but it is a hard task. And so you may say at this point, what are the objections of some philosophers or ethicists? 
And I happen to have access to a lot of them. I, I've been married to a philosopher for almost 25 years. So one of them said, how are you going to figure out the variables that a human exemplar attends to? This is feature importance. And I said, through interviews and observations of the human exemplar. In fact, I have a project where um, just this fall, we're going to have access to judges and courts in Massachusetts so we can actually interview uh, the, the judges. Then he said, I worry about the reliability of such self-reports. Of course, that is a worry for me as well. Um, but we are also going to uh, test the judges on simulated cases to get the corner cases. Then he said, I worry that judgments and simulations might not be the same as in real life. And I, I worry about that as well. But I feel like, at least right now, this, simulation, this Im imitation or apprenticeship learning task is the best task that we have. So if you think about normative ethics, and I know ethics tend to be a big word, especially among non-philosophers, there are basically three of them. There is the consequentialism. Computer scientists love that because it's basically like you are going to maximize some expected utility. And a lot of the work in fairness and machine learning has, has resided there. There's deontology, which is basically you're doing things based on rules or duties. Um, and then there is virtue ethics. And so what I'm saying here is more virtue ethics, that you should try to learn what a good person would do. So if a machine learning algorithm was going to be used on me, I would like that machine learning algorithm to have learned how would a good human do, right? And of course, again, within this normative ethics, if you want to think about it in terms of features, so there are actions, there are rules, and there are these virtues or dispositions, and every ethical theory has a little bit of all three features. It's just a matter of which feature they assume is more important than others. And in virtue ethics, disposition or, or virtue is the, is the one that's uh, highly rated. So then we as society, we should think about what should machine learning be used and what should machine learning not be used on. So if you think about bail, uh, and pretrial disposition, mass inca incarceration in the U.S. is a problem at the state level. And in America, um, the bail or pretrial disposition is supposed to decide on two things, flight risk and dangerousness. Now, flight risk is a lot more objective, right? Did I take Tina's passport away? How long has Tina been living here? Does Tina have a job? How many of her family and friends are here? So maybe flight risk is something that you could use machine learning on. But dangerousness is something that's rife with societal bias, right? And in fact, as my friend, so the access to the judges is with my friend Debbie Ramirez, who's a law professor at Northeastern. She says, uh, bail or pretrial disposition, which I do know you guys have here in Australia as well, was never designed for crime control. So in terms of bail, it should be separated out to flight risk and dangerousness, and the bar should be very high for dangerousness. And that includes for using machine learning algorithms for, for dangerousness, because uh, bail was never uh, designed to do uh, crime control, right? Um, so that is one that we really need to think about what machine learning should be applied to and what it shouldn't. The other one is, so let's think about what machine learning should be applied to. And here is where I feel like we can actually have a big impact in society by saying, okay, I'm going to use machine learning to actually try to get better data for my machine learning algorithms. And so hear me out. So laws are constraints that the society puts on us, and policies are implementation of those laws. When a policymaker issues a policy, there is an intent behind that policy. We as machine learning people can get the data, which are the droppings of implementations of these policies, and try to reconstruct the intent of the policy. If the reconstructed intent of the policy is very different than the intent of the, of the policy that the policymaker has said, then perhaps we can raise some dust and change the policy. To give you a concrete example, 
Uh, you may have heard about the stop and frisk program in New York City. Clearly, the intent of that policy was not to stop young brown and black men and harass them. But if you look at the data, it seems the intent of the policy was exactly that. So if you're able to reconstruct the policy and, and be able to justify your machine learning algorithm's decision, then maybe you can change policy. And by changing policy, you will get actually better data, less biased data, societal biased data for your machine learning algorithms. So this is where I believe machine learning should be used. And there's lots of cool approaches here that can, one can use. For example, statistical relational learning. I have highlighted one of them, Lisa Gotthor's uh, probabilistic soft logic, where you have a bunch of if-then uh, rules. You can have uncertainty scores, not just for the rule itself, but for the elements within the rule. From that, you make a graphical model, and then you could do inferences on that. And in general, we as computer scientists should think about whether computational ethics is indeed possible or not. This is something that a lot of funders are interested in, in terms of computational ethics. And I uh, highly recommend this book, uh, Moral Machines. This is different than the Moral Machine paper that recently came out on the trolley problem. So there's this whole work on crowdsource morality. Uh, Ayad Rahman, who was at MIT Media Lab, is now going to Max Planck in Berlin, and where he and his group did crowdsourcing over 40 million people about the trolley problem. We can talk about that offline. Um, this, this book came out in 2009. And I like this passage from this book. It says, the prospect of reducing ethics to a logically consistent principle or set of laws is subject given the complex intuitions of people have about right and wrong. So whether I can even reduce some kind of ethics to a bunch of consistent rules that I can put in my computer and do pattern matching it is itself suspect. And so perhaps, again, the best thing I can do, and I'm open to discussions of different tasks that we should have, and I think that's where really the creativity is. Uh, for now, it seems to me it's imitation learning, where you're trying to imitate a good judge or a good doctor, a good HR person, or a good loan officer. And then um, I want to, before I finish up on the task, I want to talk about two, <laughs> two examples of this where you think you're learning for your task, but your machine learning algorithm is learning for a totally different task. So one is um, this, uh, this is now a legend in machine learning circles where the US government back in the 80s wanted to be able to distinguish between tanks that were camouflaged in the woods and, tank, and, and, and tanks that weren't there. So I have woods, is there a tank that has been camouflaged there or not? And in fact, they trained a neural network, and uh, they thought, oh, we're doing really well, but it looks like what they actually learned was whether it was cloudy or whether it wasn't cloudy. Because when there was tanks, it was always sunny, and when it wasn't tanks, it was always cloudy. So that's what the machine learning algorithm learned. Or recently, there was some very bad science that came out of Stanford where they said that by just looking at your photo, we can tell whether you're gay or not, you're gay or not. And just imagine if you're going to a country that if being gay means your head is off your body, it's very bad, right? So they went and looked and, and scraped a whole bunch of, um, of images from online dating sites. They cleaned them. They, they trimmed them to like nice images. And it looks like what they learned was that some photos tend to have better lighting than other photos. And it had nothing to do with you being gay or not. Uh, so again, even if you have the right task, figuring out whether you learn for the right task is another thing. So now let's talk about ex the experience. I, I spent a lot of time on the task because I think the task is where a lot of creativity can happen, and we should think about that. So the experience is the data. And there's, we hear these stories all the time. And I like what uh, Joy Bulliamini, uh, this is her, says she, she talks about it as the undersampled majority problem, where the majority of the population is not white heterosexual male, but the majority of your training data is white heterosexual male. And so one of the claim to fames of Joy is that she looked at 
state-of-the-art commercial facial recognition software, and she saw that the, the software could not detect her face. And as you can see, she's a dark-skinned woman, and as soon as she would put on a white mask, all of a sudden the software was detecting her. And I was talking to my friend at IBM who's working on figuring out why the IBM software was failing. And at one point I remember him saying, I think it has something to do with the black hair. And I was suspect of like, really, black hair? You really think that was why she couldn't, you couldn't detect her face? And then there are lots of other ones, like the Nikon camera having an automated way of figuring out whether somebody is blinking or not and saying for Asians, did somebody blink? Or the famous Google case where the Google image labeler labeled an African American woman as a gorilla. And this is where for the machine learning people among you, you should think about the fact that we don't have uniform loss, right? So the fact that Google labels an African American woman as a gorilla is a huge loss for them, both PR and otherwise. And so where do you get those, uh, the initial distribution over what is really bad and what is okay in terms of the errors that your model makes is, is extremely important. So here we should think about what things should my machine learning algorithm learn on? So should I learn from demonstrations? Should I learn from simulations? Um, there's a really nice paper by Gabby Johnson on the structure of bias and uh, my interpretation of the paper, so Gabby Johnson is a philosopher, my interpretation of the paper is that basically we have explicit biases like this if then rules, but then we also have implicit biases. And the implicit biases that a human makes is basically you have these training examples and from time to time you make inferences from them. And of course inferences are noisy and that's the inconsistency that we see in human behavior. And so we should think about um, the, the examples that we're getting and what kind of biases are in those examples and uh, take that into account. As was mentioned earlier, I work on complex networks. I like graphs. They're simple objects. I got nodes. I got links, right? There's relational dependency. I can use that. Should we learn from networks? And in particular, there are two important concepts within the study of network science. One is influence, one is selection. Um, selection means that, in a sense, homophily. And in fact, individual fairness, which is a concept that the folks from differential privacy have been looking at, which is like, if you and I are similar, then we should be treated similarly, is in fact this idea of selection. That Jack and Jill are similar, so the decisions on them should be similar. And the other one is influence or guilt by association, which is Jack is friends with Jill and Jill is bad, so Jack is bad, right? This is where your mother would say like, don't hang around Bob because Bob is bad and they will have a bad influence on you. And in particular, one of the things which is interesting here is to study the dynamics of, of privilege and prejudice in such networks. So there's been recent work um, by computational social scientists. Marcus is a computational social scientist. He gave a keynote talk at ICWSM, International Conference on Web and Social Media, where his group are studying what are the processes that generate social networks and how can we uh, describe the inequalities that we see based on those processes. So there are two major processes that generate our social networks. One is homophily. When you uh, enter a society, you look for people that are similar to you. And that's also why you see a lot of triangles in social networks. So a friend of a friend is a friend. The other one is preferential attachment, where you want to attach yourself to a star. Right? That star oftentimes have a lot of resources. And so how is it that these two processes um, uh, help the, the inequalities? that we see in social networks and be able to describe that. And lastly, I want to talk about performance measures. Um, so this is where a lot of work has been done uh, in terms of group fairness, where I divide my society into groups and I say these two groups should be treated similarly or individual fairness, that, that 
given the task, if two people are similar, then they should be treated similarly, or these kinds of procedural fairness. And um, I think at last count, there was 30-something fairness measures. This is where computer scientists excel, right? I have an objective function, which is risk assessment. I'm going to add some constraints in terms of these parity measures. And there's this nice one-hour tutorial that, that, that um, Arvind gave at Fat Star. So Fat Star is fairness, accountability, and transparency. Uh, a few years ago, or, or this last year, it was February of 2018. And then there have been recent series of tutorials by Paul Bennett uh, at MSR and others at Google and so on and so forth. They gave one at Wisdom, which is the web and social data mining, also one at KDD this year uh, on, on uh, fairness and practical challenges to it. So if you're interested in all the different ways that they tweak um, measures you can get from the confusion matrix, you can look into those. But as I said, the current approaches um, are trying to put anything that has to do with fairness into these performance measures of, oh, I have my objective function, which is risk assessment, and then these constraints on, on the parity values. And so there's, they don't really hold any kind of normative uh, uh, value or status. Uh, and in particular, they ignore the task altogether. They're like risk assessment, that's it. And then they experience, okay, fine, there has been uh, work there where, okay, the data that the society gives me is biased. Maybe I can project it and embed it into this other space that's going to be all fair and good and just. And so there, there have been some work done on that. And I want to um, have a, a few words on maximizing accuracy. When you take machine learning or data science classes or data mining classes, everybody keeps talking about, you know, maximizing your performance measure, um, and sometimes at a loss for intelligibility, right? So uh, deep learning is very popular these days. Those models are not intelligible. This is a case about, uh, this is very famous, about pneumonia and asthma, where back in the 90s, um, that was the second coming of neural networks, uh, the University of Pittsburgh researchers trained a neural network to predict whether complications would arise from a person that comes to a hospital that has symptoms of pneumonia. So you want to predict complications from symptoms of pneumonia, and it seemed that the algorithm, the neural network that was trained, was saying that if you have asthma, uh, you're not going to get complications of pneumonia, which just doesn't make sense because if you show up to a hospital and you have asthma and symptoms of pneumonia, you will automatically be admitted to the hospital. So, and in fact, the way that they found this out by, is what, by looking at some rule-based approaches. And so usually, up to now, people have thought, okay, so I have to let go of accuracy for an intelligible model. And recently, Rich Caruana, Richard Caruana and his group at Microsoft Research have been working on models that are uh, both highly accurate and intelligible. And so he had a nice talk at KDD this year. And I like the title of his talk, which says, Friends Don't Let Friends Deploy Black Box Models. Uh, especially in these important high-stake cases. And so you can uh, look into his work. In fact, uh, for a lot of these, almost all of them, you can download open software and try their algorithm. So takeaway messages. Uh, one is you need to incorporate normativity or what ought to be throughout the entire machine learning or data science process, right? You should think about the task, you should think about the experience, and you should think about the performance measures. You shouldn't just say, oh, you know, I'm okay with risk assessment, I'm just going to add some constraints at the end, right? Um, the other thing which is extremely important is the incentives and the values of the human decision maker that is using your, your software. In fact, Kate Crawford, who is a researcher at Microsoft Research in New York, um, famously has said that no computer scientist can say, I'm just an engineer anymore, because your software can be used for nefarious reasons. In fact, 
the trolley problem that everybody's thinking about in terms of autonomous vehicles, this idea that there's an autonomous vehicle and all of a sudden it, it, it has this choice of, let's say, killing the grandma or killing the grandchild, that um, problem was invented by Judy Thompson, who's a philosopher at MIT, back in the 70s. Judy Thompson never in a million years thought that computer scientists were going to jump on it and now there's this whole area of, oh, trolley problems and so on and so forth. So you should think about um, how your algorithm could be used and perhaps, perhaps have disclaimers uh, as you release your algorithms. And uh, a promising task uh, seems to be apprenticeship learning. It's a hard task, especially if you're trying to mimic how a human being is um, making decisions, but I think it's a worthy uh, goal to, uh, to look into. Uh, it's a worthy task to look into. And I'm, again, open to hearing what should other tasks be in these, again, high stakes decisions. Now, before I finish, I want to say one thing about education. As I said in the beginning, the objective of my, uh, my project is twofold. One is machine learning and its uses in these high-stake decisions, the other one is education. So there's been a lot of talk on uh, teaching computer scientists ethics. And if you, for example, go to this uh, short link for this Google spreadsheet, you'll see a whole list of courses that are being taught, not just in America, but all over the world, uh, on ethics um, uh, for computer scientists. Uh, there was a really nice uh, class that was taught in, um, during the winter of 2019, I guess this would be January, February, March of, in America, so your summer at Stanford, which is really nice. Uh, and there had been papers, so this position paper was recently published in the ACM's communications um, magazine uh, that you shouldn't just have one ethics class, you should have a whole curriculum built uh, within the education of computer science, so um, computer scientists are aware of the ethical implications of their software. And I'm all for this, I'm all for education and educating computer scientists about ethics, but if we really want to make change, we need to teach the population how algorithms that affect their lives work. And this is obviously very difficult and we don't like doing it, but I feel like it's something that we should do. And this is where, for me, it became clear when the Cambridge Analytica uh, story came out. And I had uh, even law professors coming to me and saying, like, how could this be? I'm like, well, didn't you read the fine print? Didn't you, what did you think when you took that little quiz that your friend posted, right? And so we need to be able to teach the general population, well, how does Facebook make money? How does Wikipedia work? Why would you expect even Wikipedia to give you um, information that is valid? Now, this is difficult to do, uh, but it is a task that I'm undertaking, and I'm hoping that it would be a mandatory class for all undergraduates at my university. And by doing that, uh, the prereq is just high school math, which is very difficult. But I think that that's where we should teach the public about how these algorithms work. Because if I just teach my student some ethics, and he goes and works at Google as a software engineer, and he raises his hand that, I think my teacher said this is unethical, what do you think is going to happen to him? They're going to laugh him out of the room. And if he makes it up on the ranks, by the time he can make a decision or she can make a difference, he or she will have different priorities, like the stock value. And so if we want change in terms of machine learning and its use in society, what we need to do is educate the population. And so I, I want to finish by a couple of saying thanks to a couple of people. One is Danielle Allen. So Danielle Allen is the director of the Ethics Center at Harvard. She asked me to come and give a public lecture about this about two years ago. And I thought, oh, this is great. Computer scientist goes and talks to the public about broader impact. So in my next proposal, I could write broader impact. Computer scientists went and talked uh, to non-computer scientists. And then it turned out into this huge project 
Uh, Jack McDevitt, who's a criminologist, Brandon Feidelson, and Ron Sandler, they're philosophers. Ron is an ethicist. Thank you guys for listening. My slides are up there. You can download them, and that's my contact information if you don't want to ask a question here. Thank you. Thanks, Tina, for an amazingly thought-provoking and you. fascinating talk. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. Do we have any? Yes. Um, this, through the whole thing you're talking about trying to make this would be a very small moral and then basing them on humans and ex exemplars, but how would you respond to the idea that people just aren't that good at making moral decisions? So. For, for me, uh, there are people who are better and there are people who are worse, clearly, right? Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try to learn from people who are better because otherwise where am I going to get my, my moral or like virtuous people? But clearly there are virtuous people in life, right? And so if I am going to use an algorithm to make a decision, I would rather that algorithm have been trained on what a good doctor would do or what a good a judge would do. Now we can have a discussion in terms of who decides what a good judge is or what a good uh, doctor is. We can also have a decision of maybe machine learning shouldn't be used at all, which I think is nice. But currently what is happening is basically like there's a dump of data over 30 years, for example, Compass, that's what it is, right? They do not look into the fact that laws change, policies change, and they just feed it to a classifier. And clearly that is wrong. Right? That doesn't seem right because laws have changed, policies have changed. In fact, when I first started on this, I was talking to the criminologist Jack McDevitt, and he was telling me, you know, in Florida, in Broward County, which was one of these counties, they don't let the inmates get a driver's license before they get out. Florida, there's no public transportation. You happen to be a black and brown person driving because you have to drive to get to place, just to live, right, to go to work or anywhere else. You're more likely to be stopped because you're black and brown. You don't have a valid driver's license. That breaks the condition of your parole. You go back to jail. And he was saying that those kinds of cases you should remove if you want to predict recidivism because that's really, it's not in that guy's uh, um, capability to actually get one because they don't let him get one, right? And so there, there are lots of these issues with current problems of like having a dump of data and just feeding it to a classifier. Now, do you believe that there are moral people, that people are better than others in making moral decisions? I don't think I maybe would say that it would be incredibly difficult to make that call. I, like, especially, like you said, like, I would almost flip the question and be like, maybe averaging it across time and as many different ways would be better. I don't think averaging it across time would be better because, for example, in America, I don't know, 100 years ago, slavery was legal, right? So the, the changing of the laws really does matter. Uh, and so it being um, context-specific, time-specific, within this time, within these laws, is extremely important. And uh, I mean, uh, so as I was saying, laws provide constraints for us. Um, some laws provide more constraints than others. And I'm not suggesting that algorithms shouldn't be used. For example, in America, we do have algorithms that are being used that are just completely divorced from data, like three strikes and you're out, or, uh, or minimum sentencing, uh, right, uh, in terms of how many years you're in jail. So those are obviously bad, too. They're just like, rule if this, then that. Um, but the question is, what data do you, do you learn on, uh, which is up for debate, and what should the task be? Uh, and I don't know if you have this in Australia. I was just in Canberra at a workshop on morality and machine intelligence. I forgot to ask them. But in America, we do have ratings for judges, right? So if your decisions keep getting uh, overturned upon appeal, then you're not following the laws, right? At least, you know, as it goes up. And so then you're not con considered to be a good judge. And again, it's context specific. Like in, Amer in Massachusetts, the judges are appointed by the executive branch. In other places, depending on the court, the judges get elected, right? The population votes them in. And so all of those things matter. So I'm not sure that like averaging over 30 years or 50 years is actually a good thing to do. I would say not in my experience. 
of course, you're a white male, so things are good for you. You know, if I were you, I was born with a royal flush, I'm good, you know. Yeah, yeah, so. Thank you. But I appreciate your question. Do we have any questions at Caulfield? Yeah. We do have one. Hi, I'm Greg Rowland from the Societal Informatics Group. Um, I've got actually two questions. One, one is, um, even with the uh, apprenticeship task uh, kind of um, formulation, isn't there actually a datafication problem that, you know, a judge sitting at the bench can see, um, can see remorse, hope, um, you know, intent, that kind of thing, which is actually very difficult to to um, include in, in, in your vector of, of parameters? Um, so, uh, so, 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 so it depends on the, the, uh, the data that you're getting, as, as you were saying, right? So, uh, we hope to be getting lots of different types of data. So, one is, in America, there are stenographers, right? So, there is a uh, you can see the, the exchange between the judge and the lawyers or, or the defendant. Uh, in some videos, there's an echo. In, in, in some court, uh, courts, there, are, there is um, there's video. There's video. Um, we um, can also um, um, interview the judges. And the hope is that through all of that, we can see if the judge has some, some in, inherent biases that we can account for. Um, but, uh, but yes, so there's that, that, that issue. And that, that issue is going to remain in any kind of ta t machine learning task that you pick. Thanks. And, and just an, another quick question. Um, with the educating the population um, at large, isn't that pushing the problem back? Like, the, the population doesn't have to know about uh, aeronautic engineering to choose which plane they, drive, they fly on or um, medical processes. They assume that there are protocols and um, certifications and all sorts of things that happen in the background, so they actually don't have that sort of expertise. Shouldn't we be sort of developing that kind of framework for, for this sort of work? Well, the problem is that right now our lawmakers and policymakers don't know anything, and so the law hasn't ca caught up to having those kinds of safeguards. And so the uh, the idea is that if I if you if we educate the the population, then the population will elect <laughs> lawyers and uh, I mean policymakers and politicians who would care about what is happening. Um, but I think having a population that knows more is always better, right? Now, of course, I'm a professor, so I've bought into the thing that education is good. Um, but uh, I, I, we, th so, so I guess my short answer is the laws haven't caught up. And in fact, there's a lot of legal cases that are going through right now in America and in Europe, and I imagine here, I just don't know it uh, yet, about the use of machine learning in these high stake cases. Um, and so we'll have to see how, how those cases end up. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for a wonderful talk. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, we can't see the audience at Caulfield. Are there any further questions from Caulfield? No, we don't have any further questions. Thank you. I might indulge myself by asking a question. Sure. Uh, so you were, uh, uh, sorry I missed the terminology you are using, you are talking about the, the three approaches to uh, ethics and you were suggesting that uh, by uh, doing apprenticeship learning you were able to follow the, um, to learn the approach of uh, moral, uh, good moral exemplars. Virtue ethics, yeah. Uh, so virtual virtue ethics, but uh, you're selecting your good judges on the basis of their performance in not having their judgments overturned. So isn't that actually uh, a selection on the basis of outcomes uh, and hence um, much more like an outcome-based focus and aren't you at risk that you're actually learning how to make conservative decisions rather than 
morally outstanding decisions? Um, yeah, so, uh, so, so a couple of things. There was a really nice paper that came out a couple of years ago on, uh, the title is um, Contra Consequentialize This, because at, at a certain point, like all of these different um, normative uh, theories, it seems like they're all about outcomes or maximize some utility and so on and so forth. So um, I guess it's the way that I'm picking what would be a good judge. So a good judge adheres to the law and is conservative, right? And I'm saying that that is a virtuous judge because they are falling within the framework of the law. And this is where I always get pushed back in terms of like who decides, so who is the philosopher king who decides who's a good judge and who's the bad judge? And it's just a matter of, a good judge is one who adheres to the laws of the land more closely, so being conservative. So in a, in a certain aspect, um, doing virtue ethics also puts some, uh, uh, some weight on the actions and the outcomes. Uh, and basically any normative theory is going to have one of the three, so action, rules, and, and virtue or, or disposition. Um, and so... Uh, it's just how much weight they put on one versus the other, right? So I'm not learning that the judge would let Tina go in this case. I'm learning why did the judge make that decision along the way, right? Um, as opposed to uh, trying to reconstruct from, the, oh, here's the outcome. Let's learn the weights on the features. Thank yeah. you. Well, all good things must uh, end, and uh, even this extraordinary uh, talk must be brought to an end. Uh, I'd like to give you a small token oh, of our appreciation. Oh, thank you very much. Thank so, you. Uh, please, uh, thank